When you move out to the country, first you need a truck. So you can do out in the country things, of course. And then after that, you need a smaller truck, also known as a UTV or a side-by-side. -side. So you can do smaller country things, of course. But turns out those are like ten or $20,000. I could buy another regular truck for that price. One that shifts out of first gear. <laughs> Okay, you say, scale down and get something cheap like a golf cart. Well, those are like five grand too, for cruising around in the grass for grins. But what about a 1977 36 volt electric Cushman Titan industrial cart? Turns out you can get one of those for 600 bucks. Yeah, one of those might need a little work, but they look awesome. How hard could it be? So my father-in-law and I drove three hours to pick this one up. It was on one of Wisconsin's rustic roads, which was very pretty, but holy smokes, I wouldn't want to drive on this in the winter. We got it back home and unloaded it into the shed. We had to push it everywhere because the batteries were shot. And while waiting for those, Malcolm and I cleaned up the battery bay and covered it with some rust converting paint. Then the new batteries showed up. The old power system consisted of six six volt lead acid batteries. They weighed about 50 pounds each. I replaced those with these three Golden Mate 12 volt lithium iron phosphate batteries. These weigh 30 pounds each. Both sets of these, when wired up correctly, add up to 36 volts, but the new ones weigh about 180 pounds less. This is both a good thing and a bad thing, we'll find out later. Anyway, so I started those charging. Partway through charging, I asked myself, hey, I wonder how well these new batteries fit in that old battery storage compartment. Lucky for me, this battery bracket unbolts. I removed the bracket and painted more of the frame. Once it dried, Malcolm and I reinstalled the bracket. My dad stopped by to help and make sure we didn't blow ourselves up. And then we installed the new batteries. There we go. Then it was time to wire the batteries together. I started by cleaning one of the old cables that was fairly corroded. Then I wired the batteries together. The old wire from the cart used a post type connector. The new ones used ring connectors, so I converted that over. We strapped the batteries together temporarily to hold them in place. I plan to follow up and build a better bracket later, but this worked better than you might think. Then we took it for a test drive. And it worked! Oh, look at the power. Hey, you don't even do it. Yeah. I mean, this is plenty fast for three of us in here. Thanks for watching. Just kidding, it did work, but it got stuck on slight inclines. Oh no! Surely the weight drop from the new batteries didn't help with that. Also, it had no brakes. Side note, if you ever find yourself with a cart-shaped hole in the side of your shed, this white industrial duct tape works great. Anyway, before fixing those brakes, I took care of a couple easier things, such as the power control system. I had no idea how this worked in these decades-old electric vehicles, and it's actually pretty cool. This cart runs off of a set of coils that control how much electricity makes it to the motor. When you press the pedal in a little, that sets the electricity to run through a whole ton of coils that resist most of the electricity and keep the motor running slow. But as you press the pedal all the way in, that contactor moves and the electricity now goes through a spot with fewer coils to resist the electricity, letting more of it get to the motor and spin it faster. I think this is ingenious. It lets you harness the power of electricity without a ton of complicated circuitry. But it's wasteful as all heck, of course, because you're burning full power no matter what speed you're going. I'll eventually upgrade to modern electronics to get around that, but not today. Anyway, on the slow end of things, one of those coils was busted right at the end where it connected back to the cart. So in theory, the slowest speed just didn't work. So I pulled that coil pack off and I crimped a new end onto the wire.
All right. Oh, yeah. And I reinstalled it. With that fixed, I moved on to the headlight, which was burnt out somehow. So I replaced the bulb. Little retainer wires hold the bulb in, and replacing them was horrible. There. Jeez. And then Malcolm and I got to work on the brakes. It wasn't just that the brakes didn't work at this point. There were critical parts of the brake system missing. The former owner was kind enough to keep and share the rusty old parts. Among them was the master cylinder, but it was in extremely rough shape. So I just bought a new one. Malcolm helped paint it to keep it from instantly turning to rust like the old exposed cast iron one. It should now last a good 15 minutes before turning to rust at least. For the hardware, I decided to restore the old pieces and instead of buying new. I had been wanting to try nickel plating ever since watching Joffrey Croker's introduction to plating video, so I gave it a shot. It worked, but it's a lot of steps. It seems clear that the things like plain old nuts and bolts probably aren't worth doing. Unique hardware that's harder to replace is probably worth it though. Then I assembled the master cylinder. For the rest of the brake hardware, I decided to be scientific about it. Instead of replacing it all right off the bat, I thought I'd save some time and only replace the things that I needed to along the way. So that meant instead of replacing the whole brake line, I just patched in a new piece. I used what I learned from DIY Matt's brake line video and flared that new piece myself. Malcolm and I painted the frame. We prepared the old brake line for the splice using an old-fashioned flaring tool instead of the fancier one we used earlier, because that fancy one needs to be in a vise to work. The old-fashioned one actually worked okay, but no doubt the fancy one is way easier to use. And then we reinstalled the master cylinder. And we hooked up that splice. Next we needed to get the drums off the rear wheels so we could get to the brake bleeder valve easier. These drums were really on there, and of course regular sized pullers don't fit. They're too big so you can't get the nuts screwed down correctly. I ended up ordering a separate octopus looking puller instead, and that successfully pulled the hubs off. And for the record, it's always super scary doing this. <laughs> then Malcolm and I tried to bleed the brakes. Come up on here. Like on it? Yeah, yeah. You said don't to. I did say that before, just ignore that. After a bit of that, we still weren't getting fluid at the brake cylinder, and it wasn't long before we found the culprit. This old stretch of line was like Swiss cheese. So I bent and flared a new brake line and replaced it going back to the flexible line reaching to the back axle. It took me forever to get the fittings to stop leaking. I tightened everything way past the point where I thought these little fasteners would break. 
But that's what it took. Not fun stuff. Then it was time to bleed the brakes again, but at 2 in the morning I had no Malcolm to help. Instead I tried a pressure brake bleeding tool. This is supposed to push fluid from the master cylinder to the wheel cylinders with air pressure. But the cap didn't fit on this style of master cylinder. I modified it a bit to make it fit better and tried again but it just wouldn't seal. So I ended up with a bunch of brake fluid all over the place, except for out of the bleeder screws, of course. I tried again with some manual methods in an attempt to replace Malcolm. That didn't work well either. At this point, I concluded that the wheel cylinders must have been clogged, so I bit the bullet and decided to change them. I mostly avoided this since these are drum brakes, which feel like they're Rube Goldberg level contraptions of springs and horror, and I'd have to take them apart to get the wheel cylinders out. But I saw a tip from Derek Sasquatch Garlets for this. He used some straps to spread the brake shoes apart, and that let him get the wheel cylinder out without otherwise taking things apart. This looked dangerous and scary as heck, but working without those straps in is not without risks either, with all those high-powered springs that are in drum brake systems. And I'd probably still be working on the brakes right now if I went down that path. So this seemed worth a shot for those reasons. Anyway, it was tricky finding pieces to attach the straps, but it seemed to work well enough to let me replace the cylinders. Until I ripped one of the boots, of course. These are just protecting the innards from dust, and I'm not using the cart all that much, so I left it for now with plans to fix this later, but I definitely will hate myself when these lock up again before I can get a chance to fix them. At this point, I was sick of working on the brakes, so I threw more money at it. I bought a different brake bleeder to try. This Harbor Freight version pulled a vacuum from the wheel cylinder side, instead of pushing it through like the other one. Surely this would get some fluid out. But nope, still no dang fluid. So I unscrewed all the rear brake lines and tried to blow them out with air. The hard lines both cleared out successfully with a bunch of black gunk coming out. But the soft line was immensely clogged. I really had the air compressor going full blast and it still wouldn't clear. There's no fixing that, of course. I tried getting one from an auto parts store, but it was too short. Three days later, one I ordered off the internet showed up. It had the wrong threads. Unbelievable! Out of frustration, I grabbed the old line again. This time I drizzled some PB blaster down the hose, and I grabbed a bit of welding wire to see if I could maybe over a period of hours get the hose unclogged. Two minutes later, my hose was good as new again. Why didn't I try this before? So I reinstalled it, and I tried bleeding the brakes again. And magic! Fluid came out. So finally I got both brake lines bled, so I reinstalled the drums and the wheels. They didn't want to go on, so I had to adjust them into place. With the brakes fixed, I checked one last thing, the brake light. This didn't seem to light up before. I assumed it would work after I got the master cylinder installed because there's two wires that connect to that master cylinder and I thought the brake pedal would activate the light. But after sanding off the brake light bulb a bit and reinstalling it, it now just lit up when the headlights were on, but the brake pedal did nothing. It was good enough for this moment, but I'll revisit that later. Finally, it was time to test it out again. The throttle worked and so did the brakes. It was magical, and it only took me nine months, just like having a baby. There are still plenty of things left to do on the cart, but it's good enough for now. So on to the next one. Thanks for watching.